Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to my Photoshop Bootcamp. My name is Howard Pinsky, Senior Design Evangelist here at Adobe. Hope you're all doing well on this Thursday morning, afternoon, or evening. If you are tuning in live here on Behance today, let me know in the chat who you are and where you're tuning in from. We've got Frank and Clarissa and Patrick and Uriel and who else we have? Carol, great to see you all. Oliver, Sam. Hope you're all having a great Thursday, almost Friday, almost the weekend. Marsh is saying excited about the stream, loved yesterday's. Thank you, appreciate that. Today's gonna be a little bit different. Yesterday and the day before, we worked on more or less a single project. Today, the last day of this Photoshop Bootcamp, we're gonna be mixing things up a little bit. We're gonna be diving into a bunch of different tips and tricks, including photo restoration, color changing and replacement. Uh, we're gonna dive into possibly some textiles you may have seen on Twitter or Instagram, I think I posted. I've been experimenting with a gold textile because I found is there just hasn't been very many decent gold textiles in terms of Photoshop templates online. So I've been working on a very specific one, trying to get it right. It's difficult, but we're getting there. And then smart objects. Who knows where we'll take it next. Maybe we'll look at Puppet Warp. I don't know, we'll see. We've got someone from Central Texas is cold. I've been hearing that it's uh, more power issues and freezing rain and all that stuff in Texas. Hope you're all staying warm and safe and hopefully your power isn't out. Crazy stuff. Sweating doing yard work in Florida. Oh boy, hopefully I'm keeping you company in Florida. And Switzerland. Ooh, I've always wanted to go to Switzerland. Maybe I'll dive in there one day. Montreal, great to see you, Frank from Montreal. Uh, not to, I've spent a lot of time in Montreal when I was younger. Alrighty, so here we go. We're gonna go ahead and hop over boop, to my screen. And this is the starter file for today's bootcamp. Someone will post a link in the chat or you can download it in the description of this video. And here are a few assets that we're gonna be working with, starting with photo restoration over here on the left-hand side. Now, I feel like as we're progressing as we're all getting older the amount of these types of photos are not as they just we just don't see them as often anymore a lot of them are unfortunately getting lost uh, some of them are getting digitized and fixed pretty quickly but some of them still exist you might be going through your parents uh, or grandparents you know boxes of photos somewhere and you might scan some of these in and, and you know unfortunately a lot of them are just very damaged right so Photo restoration has been something that has been around for a while and a lot of people do it in Photoshop. Now there's an easier way, right? So I wanna show you first how typically, traditionally, you would do something like this. And then I wanna show you how one of the neural filters can help take this to the next level, just make your life so much easier, right? And that's what we're trying to do with some of our neural filters. We're not necessarily trying to replace artists because nobody wants that, right? We want to make your life a little bit easier, speed up your workflows. And something like this, I can almost guarantee you, nobody enjoys or very few people enjoy sitting and, you know, editing out every single little scratch. You just want to put your photo in here, press a button or two, make a few changes, and then you have something cool, right? So there are a few ways we can start tackling a photo restoration like this, right? Obviously, looking at this photo, it's very washed out. And that's mainly because the cameras back then just were not great. Didn't have that dynamic range. Obviously, there was probably very little lighting in this particular case. So what we might want to do, we might want to start with some layer styles, adjustment layers. That's what I wanted. Layer styles were coming later. So down at the bottom of your layers panel, you can start with an adjustment layer. And for something like this, there are so many different adjustment layers you can potentially use. Something like brightness and contrast is a decent one, right? And that allows you to increase the contrast a little bit. Maybe darken the brightness a touch. And that looks not bad, right? Before, after. It's already starting to look interesting, right? We can also try something like curves, which I talked a little bit about yesterday and the day before, and this allows you to adjust the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. So I'm gonna go ahead and pl place some points. I'm just doing this over here in my properties panel, which by the way, if you lose your properties panel, if you don't have it, under the window menu, go down to view, properties. There it is. There's also a lot of different panels you can put around your, your document, right? So I can go ahead and sharpen up and darken the shadows a little bit, darken the midtones, 
darken the highlights, right? And kind of go from here. Now, what you're also noticing is down at the bottom, we have much brighter area than up at the top, right? So one single adjustment layer may not necessarily fix everything. So one thing you can do, and all the adjustment layers that you add are going to come with layer masks. And this is going to be very important. So I'm going to go ahead and add, let's say maybe one more curves adjustment layer. And as I'm editing this, I really want to just pay attention to this bottom section. So if I darken this, and you're obviously noticing that the areas at the top are also darkening. And it doesn't look too bad, but we really want to focus down at the bottom. So I'm going to over darken you know, some of the areas at the top. Again, not too concerned about. So I'm going to over darken that bottom area. I'm just pulling on these handles here. Again, you can use levels, you can use brightness and contrast, all sorts of different things. But in terms of the bottom area, that looks pretty good. But the top area, I would say, is definitely a little bit too overdone. It looks fine with the first, actually, I probably have to go back and make changes to the first adjustment layer. But in terms of the second one, this is looking pretty good. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that only that bottom section is visible. And we can do that using a gradient on our layer mask. So over on the left hand side in the tools bar, we're going to choose the gradient tool. And then at the top, I want to make sure that I have the first option, either the first or second, this could work in this case, either foreground to background or foreground to tri transparent, either one of those should work, I'm going to choose foreground to transparent, but I want to make sure that black is the foreground color. So I'm going to press the X key on my keyboard to swap right over here. And then I'm going to go ahead and drag down from about the middle downwards. And what that's going to do, if you take a look, right, it's going to hide essentially everything up at the top, and it's going to gradually reveal or allow the bottom to be revealed, right? And it's going to hide everything up there. Now we can go back to this first curves adjustment layer that I was working on and make some changes there just so things kind of match. And the nice thing about using that gradient is it all kind of blends nicely together. So if I hide both of these, right, we're already starting to see some nice color adjustments, which is great. So in terms of color adjustments, this is going to get you there. But we still obviously have a long way to go because we have some, you know, scratches up here. We have a lot of different scratches. And again, I want to show you how you can typically traditionally do this. So I'm going to go ahead and let's hide these adjustment layers for a second. And I want to go ahead and create a new layer. So in at the bottom of my layers panel, I'm going to press the plus button. And we want to make sure that all of our healing is done non destructively. So I'm going to go ahead and um, in my tools bar, I'm going to find my spot healing brush tool. And what this is going to allow me to do is at the top, I'm going to make sure sample all layers is checked on. And let's choose something simple for now, right about here, right? What this allowed me to do is simply brush over top of a scratch and it disappears, right? So you can just go through and make some very simple changes. But again, this takes a long, long time. If you have a very scratched up photo, you're going to be sitting here for a while. So instead, what we're going to try to do is we are going to explore one of the newer neural filters in Photoshop, photo restoration. Now I have this photo layer selected. I'm going to go ahead and convert it into a smart object, either by right clicking on it and then choosing convert to smart object or under the filter menu, I can go down to convert for smart filters, right? And like I explained in past boot camps, it's taking the original pixels of this layer and embedding them in a separate embedded document, if that makes sense. So that if you have to resize it down and then back up, it still has those original pixels to reference. But if you're also working with filters, you're able to go to any of the filters and it's going to add it on as a, essentially as a separate layer. So you can turn it off, you can hide it, you can add a layer mask to it and you know hide bits and pieces of it, but it's really cool. So down here, we're going to look for the photo restoration neural filter right down here at the bottom. So I'm going to turn that on and immediately it's going to get to work as you can see down here at the bottom, right? And in a second, we're going to see its initial result. Now, in some cases, it may look overdone. But what you're noticing is that it did a decent job at correcting some of the lighting, 
like we were doing with our curves adjustment layer. Um, and you know, some of the faces, it tried to restore a little bit, but over to the right hand side, you do have some more control. So if the faces look a little bit too enhanced, you can just drop this slider down, let's say to around 10 maybe. And we now have that. Now, of course, you know, with these older photos, the faces are likely going to be pretty blurry. And that's kind of what face, enhanced face, that slider tries to do, right? It tries to enhance some of the faces using AI and all this fun stuff. It does an okay job, but again, in some cases, it might be overdone. So I'm going to keep it relatively low. I think we all have to just understand that some of the faces in these older photos are just going to be blurry, right? We can also enhance the photo itself. So if I drop this down to zero, you're noticing that was the before, right? Very washed out, a lot of noise, haven't really touched on the scratches yet, but the lighting doesn't work. And if I bump it all the way up to 100, right? Overdone. So you have to really find that sweet spot. So I would definitely experiment with, you know, there's 20. That's not too bad. I think I'm going to go somewhere around 30, somewhere in this range here, because I know that later on, I can always dive into those adjustment layers that I was showing you earlier and kind of tweak it to my liking. Now, one of the big things that you're probably going to want to use with an example like this is the scratch reduction slider. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this all the way up to 100 and see what happens. It's probably not gonna grab all these scratches, but let's see what happens. And this could take a while. Depending on the size of the photo, depending on how many scratches, I would imagine Photoshop is going through, right? Detecting everything that it knows to be a scratch and using something like content-aware fill or healing or whatever it might be to do its best to remove it. Now, <laughs> Apparently it thought that half of this guy's face was a scratch. Um, so it, you know, 100, it's usually gonna be overdone. So let's drop it down to maybe 30. Let's see what that looks like. Hopefully this guy's face comes back. Um, and that's the thing with these neural filters. They're definitely in beta, as you can tell, right? And they're always gonna get better. And there's a little option down here to your mileage, mileage may vary, yes, indeed. There's an option down here to, you know, are you satisfied with these results, yes or no? And if, if it doesn't look good, press that no button because that's going to help train the system to you know, do a better job in the future. And it's always tricky with these older photos because a lot of them are very different. And sometimes scratches can be mistaken or faces can be mistaken for scratches and all sorts of different things, right? So let's see what happens. All right, it's, it's getting there, right? So before and after. Again, you know, this guy's face, I think because possibly the... Um, you know, it's, it's, his face is very bright. It might be mistaking it. So it's an interesting, uh, you know, use case, right? Do we apply some adjustment layers first to deal with the lighting to help Photoshop figure out what's a scratch and what's not a scratch? Maybe. Let's try that, right? I love experimenting. So let's go ahead and bring back our adjustment layers. So we have you know, a bit of a sharper image, right? Maybe I'll drop some of the highlights a little bit, especially in, you know, that area there, right? It's a little bit too bright, which might've been throwing Photoshop off. I don't know. Marsh is saying it would be cool if you could mask out areas you didn't want touched. Yes, so, so there's a few ways you can do that, right? Um, obviously, when you apply the neural filter, which I did not do in this case, it would give you a layer mask. So you can paint some of that stuff out. You can use a gradient or a soft brush to gradually remove some of those areas, but it would be kind of cool, very similar to the um, content aware fill feature. So you can kind of d exclude areas from uh, Photoshop kind of messing with the scratches, but that would be nice. That's good feedback. I should pass that along, right? So I'm gonna go ahead, whoops, I don't need that one. There we go, right? So I'm just making sure that those much lighter areas are quite a bit darker. And I can also maybe experiment with our dodge and burn tool, which is over here. So maybe I wanna burn, let me create a new layer and very similar to what I showed you, I think it was in yesterday's or the day before, what we can do is fill this with 50% gray, go down to soft light and this will allow us to burn non-destructively. Let 
There we go. That's looking a little bit better, right? Got to be very subtle with some of these things. You don't want to overdo it. And unfortunately, you know, many of these old photos, they're not raw photos, obviously. So they're missing a lot of raw data that they don't have any raw data, right? So it becomes tricky at times. All right, so now that I've gone through and I have adjusted the color a little bit, let's see if this neural filter works a little bit better. So I'm gonna select all of these layers and I'm going to create a smart object with all of them so that they're essentially, when we apply a filter, they're essentially kind of looked at as one layer. So I'm gonna convert it to a smart object. And now what we're gonna do, back up to filter, down to neural filters. And then down at the bottom, we're gonna turn on the photo restoration neural filter and we're gonna see what happens. We're gonna see if it, we have better results. All right, I'm gonna turn down photo enhancement one more time. I'm gonna bring down enhance face again. Something like that, right? And now this time, let's crank up scratch reduction up to 100%. I'm expecting it to be overdone and you know maybe his face will be a little bit distorted again, but we're looking for a better result. And if that's the case, I might take this feedback back to the team and maybe there's something they can do that you know in the background, it applies some lighting adjustment. Okay, there his face is still a little bit, you know, not, some, not so great. Um, but bring it down to 20. We'll see if it deals with those scratches. Again, 100%. It's gonna be overdone, right? Let's see what happens, here we go. Now it's still, yeah, scratch reduction is a little bit hit or miss, right? And then under adjustments, you also have things like noise reduction, which obviously this image does have quite a bit of noise. So let's wait for the scratch reduction to complete. Yeah, it's a little bit, uh hit or miss, right? Um, but noise reduction should definitely help a little bit as well. So I'm gonna bump that up. The thing with these neural filters, large images, it's gonna take a little bit of time. So once, we, once this one is complete, I'm gonna go ahead and apply this neural filter because the lighting is looking pretty good. It did enhance the photo um, a little bit. And then we are going to you know, manually remove some of those scratches before we move on to the next example. Some talk about raw chicken in the chat. I don't know what's going on, but uh, there we go. Megan, great to see you. How's Edmonton doing? How's, how are the, uh, the Oilers doing? I think they're doing okay, right? I think they're in a wild card spot. Anyways, um, here we, the joys of live stream. We got to wait for things to uh, process. But it's almost done, 96%, and there we go. So it did a decent job with noise. Again, maybe a little bit overdone. What I found in the past is some people, you know, crank up these sliders or they overdo their photo restorations that just look a little bit unnatural. Um, so probably don't do that, right? I'm gonna go ahead and press okay. It's gonna apply this as a smart filter down here at the bottom. So I can always double click to make changes to it. Um, but now I can dive in just like we were doing before and create a new layer, grab the, let's say the spot healing brush tool and brush over top, right? Make it a little bit larger. Get rid of some of these areas here. So the neural filters definitely help, right? Um, but they're never gonna be perfect. Oh, they might be at some point, but they're not perfect at the moment. They're still being trained, still in beta. Um, so definitely use your healing tools. And for this larger area, you can certainly use a spot healing brush, or you can grab something like the lasso tool, draw around it, and then maybe use something like the patch tool, which will allow you to kind of draw, grab this and move it on over. It's gonna heal that out really nicely. And there we go, right? All right. So a little bit about photo restoration. Um, some of it is definitely a manual process, but hopefully you get the idea. All right, let's move on to example number two, or tip number two, uh, changing colors. And I know a lot of people want to be able to do this in Photoshop. And this image here, which I grabbed from Adobe Stock, what you're able to do, what you want, might want to do, is you might want to change the color of 
the couch, right? He does not read the suggestions. Uh, hold on, let, let me see. Hold on, mask the subject and then apply the filter. Yes, you can certainly do that. Um, the problem with, with masking the subject is you have to, I mean, it's not difficult, but it's a little bit more time consuming. Select all the subjects and then make sure they're extracted from the background. Um, and then you can either apply that neural filter to the background itself or the subjects itself. Sometimes it could create a little bit of a separation between the background. So you'll have to almost, you know, heal the background first. I have tried that in the past, but I do take a look from time to time at the suggestions. Thank you. All right, so back over here. We're gonna wanna maybe change the color of let's say the couch, right? But maybe not both of the couches, maybe just one of the couches. So what we can do is I'm gonna go ahead and select this image here. And you know, there are many ways to change colors in Photoshop. And one way you can do it, and I've seen this in the past, is to select an object like this. So you can go ahead and choose, let's say your selection tool, maybe the object selection tool, for example. And this is an interesting image because there are a lot of different objects in here. So as you can see at the top, the object selection tool is currently looking for all the objects. And what we can do now is we can hover over top of them and it's going to allow us to select. We can select the pillows itself, the painting up here, you know, this object over here, and it does a decent job. So we can go ahead and click on this to select this object. And then what we can do is we can create a new layer. And then maybe we want this to be blue, for example, right? So we can obviously take a blue brush, make it larger, paint over top of it. And we have a blue catch. There we go. All done. Obviously not, right? So once you have an object painted, Obviously this is not gonna do, but the magic of blend modes is that you can really start to dial that in a little bit. So as you hover over top, you're obviously noticing some of them are okay, some of them not so great. A lot of it depends on the color of the, and the, and the tones of the object below it, right? But down at the bottom, you have your hue, saturation, and color options. These are kind of where you're gonna start to see something happen. It looks okay, right? And if, of course, if you tweak that color on that new layer a little bit, you might be able to get there. So that's one way to do it. A little bit unnatural, honestly. So what I would do is we can actually, actually go back if we wanted to, to the area where we have the selection of this couch, right? And then down at the bottom, we might wanna try out our adjustment layer. So something like hue and saturation, for example. We've explored this in the past a little bit, and this will allow us to really kind of shift this over, right? So we have a blue couch, just like that, right? We can also use the colorize option down at the bottom if this initial adjustment didn't work that well. But I think in this case, if I bump this up, it's not bad. That purple's kind of nice. We can adjust the lightness, all that stuff. Right. And the nice thing about having this adjustment layer with the layer mask is we can now dive in and add additional adjustments. So if we wanted to adjust the, you know, the lighting a little bit with curves, right, we can very easily do that. And what you're noticing now is it's by default applying that adjustment to the entire image, right? So what we can do is right click on this particular adjustment layer and then create clipping mask. Or like I showed yesterday, you can hold down your alter option key, hover in between and click. That'll make sure that's applied only to that particular layer down below, right? Which is wonderful. Now, what you might be noticing is that if I zoom in here and turn this off, it's also applying that adjustment to the pillow, which we may not want. So on the adjustment layer, we do have our layer mask. And what we're able to do is we're able to in a few different ways, remove that pillow, right? So I can grab a brush, for example, and with black as my foreground color, I'm gonna drop the hardness to zero. I can just start painting over top of this, whoops, just to make sure at least the greens in the leaves come through. We may want a little bit of that blue down here because it's kind of bouncing off. That yellow is bouncing off that white of the pillow. So it would probably make sense for some of that blue to be there, right? Make this smaller. And of course you can use selections to select just the pillow if you wanted to, to make it a little bit better. But you're, you're kind of noticing some of the blue is still coming on in, right? So I'm gonna switch this over just to kind of bring that back a little bit. There we go. 
something like that. All right, looking a little bit better, right? Could you match the color to a, spe a specified sw uh, swatch color? So there's a few ways to match color. Um, there is under the adjustments menu, there's match color somewhere over here, down here at the bottom. You can also use a neural filter like uh, harmonize or color transfer. Um, but one thing you can also do is, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so you can add additional adjustment layers. So maybe if you wanted to, for example, this couch over here on the right-hand side, let's go ahead and select this one. Maybe I'll use my quick selection tool and maybe just select this particular, on the wrong layer. Right, there we go. Something like that. Pillow's not great, but I'm gonna make sure to deselect some of that pillow. And then I'm gonna add one more adjustment layer. Maybe I'll add it at the top here. Maybe hue and saturation one more time. Let's add colorize. Maybe we'll shift this to a nice pink color, right? So you can definitely apply multiple adjustment layers to your uh, images and have them all separated uh, throughout using layer mask and all sorts of fun things, right? Bump this up, maybe with white, whoops. Just kind of subtly bring in some of that pink using a nice soft brush like that, right? There we go. That looks okay. That could work. All right, can you show the method using the hand symbol there and dragging it onto the image, the hand symbol. Are you talking about the, the hand tool, the one that I'm, when I hold down my space bar, moving like that? Or clarify and let me know if that's what uh, we're looking at. Now, one more thing before we move on to the next is we've got this painting up here at the top. And what we might wanna do is replace that painting with something different. So what, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hop over to Finder, right over here, and I do have some images, and I have this image from Adobe Stock I might wanna use. I'm gonna pop that in there. Make it a little bit smaller, right? And what you're noticing is that image is not perfectly straight. So one thing that, I mean, there are many ways we can do this, but and I'm gonna show you some of that in, I think the fourth tip that we're gonna dive into. But when you're transforming, of course you have these handles, right? And you can hold down shift to constrain it, but you can also hold down your command or control key, command key on the Mac, control key on Windows. And this will allow you to just kind of warp this like this. Use some, get some perspective in here. Just so that it's on a little bit of an angle. Right under the word preset in the color palette. Oh, let's see. Maybe it's with the adjustment layers. Aha, so, good call. So we have right over here, this little hand, hand tool over here, right? Uh, let's go over. All right, so let me add a new adjustment layer. Whoop, this will allow you to um, adjust colors uh, on, on a specific level. So let me actually hide these. Hide those. Oh, where did the image go? There we go. So I'm going to add an adjustment layer. Q and saturation, right? And of course, you can go ahead and adjust this manually. But underneath master, we have the ability to choose specific colors, right? Red, yellows, greens, cyans, blues, magentas, blah, blah, blah. And if we choose yellows, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't okay job, right? It's definitely detecting a group of yellows, a preset group of yellows. But if you have specific colors that you want to adjust, if I go back over here, I can choose this hand tool that um, Carol was talking about. And this will allow me to actually click and drag on specific yellows, right? So I can click and drag side to side like that to kind of adjust some of those yellows, right? And I can hold down my command or control key and then click and drag to adjust the hue. So with no command or control key, clicking and dragging, adjust saturation, right? And then holding down command or control, clicking and dragging. So it's kind of looking at the more specific yellow that is um, that you're clicking and dragging on, right? So it does help from time to time. Then you can go up here to the greens and maybe adjust those a little bit. 
So it kind of saves you from going over to the right-hand side in your properties panel, or if you don't have that properties panel open for whatever reason, then you can easily make those changes just with that hand tool, right? Let me undo this and go back. You know what, that looks pretty good. I might wanna make a little change, so I'm gonna just transform that a little bit. Maybe I will dive into my layer style, so double click on this. I'll add a little bit of an inner shadow, maybe a dark inner shadow. Maybe I don't want any distance, I want just on the sides here, maybe I'll add a little bit of choke. Maybe I'll adjust the blend mode to something like soft light. Bring this in a little bit more, just so it has a bit of an edge to it. There we go. And now we have a new painting, right? Which is wonderful. All right, ready for some fun? Gold. We're gonna dive into some gold. Where did my chat go? There we go. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, I've been experimenting with some gold layer styles and just to kind of show you what I've been working on. Um, here's some ideas. You know, this one's a little bit of a darker gold. And when I posted this on Twitter, you know, some people mentioned that there could be some accessibility issues. Obviously the background is a little bit too dark for this particular case, but I'm now kind of in this range here. Gold is very gold, right? And I was being a little bit conservative with how shiny my textiles are. So I'm kind of here right now. I'm, I'm still tweaking it a little bit, but I want to kind of show you how I got to this point. And a lot of it is trial and error and experimentation. So it all starts with a text layer, right? And I have this text layer here. And this current text or typeface is the Ono oh Blaze Face typeface. And if you go over to fonts.adobe.com, what I was able to do here is I was able to browse the uh, luxury fonts. And there's a lot of different typefaces that you can potentially use for something like gold, right? And I can type in up here, gold, just to kind of give me, give me a preview of what it might look like. And I might want, you know, to narrow it down to a much thicker, heavier weight, right? And now we have some interesting typefaces. Uh, Courage is an interesting one. And somewhere in this list is that Ono oh Blaze face. They also have Ono oh uh, Fat face as well. Interesting names, but some of them are, you know, Lust Sands I, I used on, and Lust I used on day two. Interesting, but these, you know, these very thin areas could throw off the style a little bit. So you really need specific typefaces uh, to, you know, for an effect, effect like this. So let me hop back over to Photoshop. And the first thing we want to do is we want to start applying a color, right? And the nice thing about this is, you know, all this is editable afterwards. So I'm going to start with something like maybe in this range here, right? Just to kind of give me a base, maybe add a little bit more. Anika's saying, oh no, I love them all. Yeah, they make some really nice typefaces. Um, let me actually go back just for a second and look up, oh no, oops, oh no. So here, oh no, there we go. So oh no fat face, here's one of them. And it's made by the oh no type company, right? And yeah, so they have some really interesting, obviously some of these, like this one here, you're not gonna use on a daily basis, but you know, they got some interesting one. This one here could potentially work for a gold um, typeface. I'm going to try that out after this boot camp. That's an interesting one. They have some pretty fun ones. All right, back over here. So we have our color in place. Now, of course, this is not gold, <laughs> but where we're going to get gold from is our layer style. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on this layer. Now, I'm going to add the layer styles now. And then we're gonna talk about smart objects using type in just a moment, right? So what the main, th the main group of layer styles that you're probably gonna to want to experiment with for things like gold or chrome or whatever it might be will be bevel and emboss. Let me reset this to the default. And the default for something like this just isn't great, right? It's, you see this a lot. You see this very basic kind of effects going on. Yeah, right? Definitely experiment with the lighting. Definitely experiment with the contours and the blend modes and all sorts of different things. So I'm going to start, I'm going to keep it at inner bevel because I do want that bevel to kind of go into the type layer. 
Smooth is okay. You know, I found that Chisel Hard and Chisel Soft, they produce these edges that they, they just don't work for me, right? So I'm going to keep it at smooth. I'm going to bump up the depth a little bit. And you're noticing it's kind of, it's making it looking a little bit deeper, right? So somewhere around like, let's say 230 looks interesting. I'm going to keep the direction it up. Of course, you can go down if you want to, depending on where you want that lighting. And then maybe the size I'll increase just a touch, right? It's looking fine, right? Not great. Down here at the bottom, the shading is where things are really going to start to look a little bit better. And then we're going to add a contour as well. I'm going to turn off global light for this particular example. Many of you have asked in the past, what does global light do? And what global light does is it'll make it so that all the layer styles that you add, not just on this layer, but other layers as well, if you have global light turned on, will use the same lighting direction, right? So the angle and the altitude just keeps things a little bit more consistent. Um, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to bump it to like, let's say 120, whoops, wrong way. And then 30 could potentially work. Once you start experimenting with the gloss contours, then you might want to go back and adjust the angle and the altitude. But watch what happens when I go ahead and choose some different gloss contours, right? Whoops. You're starting to see that the lighting is changing. And especially these ones down here at the bottom, the ring and the double ring will, will start to give you some interesting effects. And look at that. Already, we're kind of getting into the interesting range, right? I'm a big fan of these two. And if you want to edit it, you can always click on this and, you know, move these points around if you want to make, you know, the center a little bit brighter or whatever it might be. But I'm going to keep it at that for now. And then you can start to experiment with the highlight mode, right? So screen or something like Overlay, not too bad, right? Overlay is definitely going to make your highlights a little bit more vibrant. But something like Color Dodge, for example, could really start to add some nice highlights to your particular uh, design, right? Multiply, I think, could look okay for the shading, but I might want to add in a little bit of maybe orange or gold in here, right? And that looks okay. And I think the altitude can probably work. Ooh, Let's leave it at 30 for now, right? Now, another thing we might want to add is a contour, and that's going to really work on the edges of this textile. So I'm going to turn this on, and the default contour is really not going to look like anything, right? And you're also going to want to turn on anti-aliased, which is going to smooth out the edges, because sometimes you'll find that they're a little bit too chiseled and hard. So we're going to keep anti-aliased turned on. And then for the contour, let's experiment. Let me bring this down to maybe, let's say, around 25. And it's already giving an interesting effect, but definitely experiment with the different uh, contour presets as well. So something like maybe ring. Interesting, right? But not great, but it could work. Now I am zoomed in, so we're seeing a little bit of, you know, chiselness going on. And also back over here, we want to make sure to turn anti-alias on here as well, which is going to help smooth out the entire uh, text effect, right? Let me bring this down to about 25. So we're getting there. We're getting there, but we're certainly not there yet. Another thing we might want to add, depending on how you want your text to look, is maybe a bit of a texture, right? So you can add something like, you know, some of these textures may not seem like they they're going to really help at all, but something like a water texture, right? Maybe I'll bring the depth down to about five. Just to add a little bit of texture to your gold, right? Before and after. It could work, right? And then maybe we'll want a little bit of an outer glow. Bump this down a little bit. Color dodge may not work that well. No, probably not in this case. Unless we bump it down a little bit, right? Just nice and subtle. So this is looking okay. But I feel that if we add one more additional bevel and emboss, which you can't do on a single layer, you have to add a separate layer, we might be able to really start to get a nice gold, shiny feel to it. Now, what you might want to do is you might want to just duplicate this layer, Command and Control J to duplicate, right? Maybe I'll hide the outer glow. And you might want to dive in here and make some changes to it 
a bunch of different things, right? Let me just make some changes. And one thing we'll have to do is turn the fill opacity down so we can see both layers at the same time, right? So we'll make some changes to this. Obviously, this is not what we're gonna go with, but you get the idea, right? It's not too bad though. So now we have two layers with different layer styles. The problem that we're gonna run into is that if we wanted to update this text, we'd have to update both layers manually. So we'd have to go to the first one and type something like hello, right? And then go to the second one, right? And then hello. Which isn't the worst thing in the world, but to make our lives a little bit easier, let me delete this layer. Let me actually go back to here, delete, whoops, wrong layer, there we go. Let's work with a smart object. So I'm going to, I'm gonna copy these layer styles because I'm pretty happy with them right now. So I'm gonna copy the layer styles and I'm going to clear those layer styles. And I wanna make this text layer into a smart object. Now, if I were to simply right click on it and then convert to smart object, and then I double click on it, we're gonna be brought to a document that's basically the same size as that text. So if we run into the, pro we might run into a problem where we do something like hello, it chops it off a little bit, right? Which we probably don't want. Where, where did, there we go, right? We don't want that. So what I'm gonna do instead, let's undo this before I made the smart object. And I'm also going to create, let's say a rectangle around this just so I have the whole size of our document, turn the opacity down to zero. And then with these both, both layers selected, convert to smart object. Now I can paste the layer styles. And now if I needed to, I can double click on this, open up this layer, make some changes. I have all the document space that I need to, and you'll see that in just a moment. But what we wanna do now is we want to add that additional layer and layer style, right? So I'm gonna duplicate this layer one more time, Command Control J. Let's get rid of this outer glow. And I'm gonna double click on the bevel and emboss, and we're gonna make some changes. So I'm gonna remove the texture here. And like I mentioned earlier, we definitely want the fill opacity down to zero, because we still want the layer styles to show. So we want the opacity at 100%, but the fill opacity down to zero. And now we're gonna experiment with our bevel and emboss again. So let's bring this up somewhere, let's say 450-ish. And then we'll, we'll keep the direction at up. Maybe the size will bump up to let's say 45, somewhere in that range there. But I think we're gonna definitely want something a little bit different than our current double ring gloss contour. So maybe the second one over here, which is the cone, right? And we're starting to get somewhere. Color dodge, I think, could work. I don't think we'll need any shading for this because we really want to focus on the highlight. So I'm going to bring this down. And then the contour, we might want to keep it on the more simple side. So something like this first one. And then maybe 25 could look pretty good. Ariel is asking, could you explain fill opacity? Sure. So if you're to take a look at this example here, let me bring fill opacity back up to 100%. Opacity controls the opacity, right, of the entire layer with all its elements. So if I were to bring the opacity down to zero, that layer would completely disappear, right? But that's not what we want. We want to be able to see the layer styles that we're working on, but we don't wanna see the original layer, which is basically that simple color, right, which is this. So we don't wanna see that, but we wanna see the layer style. So I'm gonna, so bringing down the fill opacity, will essentially hide the original gold or that plain uh, color, right? But it's gonna allow our layer styles to still show, which in this case is exactly what we want. Could you use the FX layers and then add the second effects to the first gold layer? So I don't believe you can with, I could be wrong, but I don't believe you can with bevel and emboss. Uh, some of them, as you can see with the plus button to the right, you can add multiple strokes, inner shadows, color overlays, gradient, so on and so forth. But bevel and emboss, I believe you can only have one. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong. But I think in this case, you can only do uh, one bevel and emboss per layer, right? So I can, you know, let's go through and I think, ooh, that one's not too bad, but I think this one looks pretty nice. It has some nice highlights. So if I turn this off, there's the original layer and there's the new layer with our 
new bevel and emboss. I think that could work. And now I can dive back and make some changes to, let's say, our original bevel and emboss. Maybe bump this up a little bit. Experiment with the, yeah, I think that could work. I think that'll do. RB says bevel and boss only one. Yeah, I think so. All right, I think that could work. So it's an interesting gold effect, right? There's a lot of different ways we can go about it. I'm still experimenting where I'm gonna go with this. But like I showed earlier, because we're working with a smart object, you can double click on any of these layers, right? Whoops. And it's gonna open up the embedded document. So I can go ahead and type out something like boop, right? And maybe I can change the color. Maybe I want more of a chromey look, right? So I can just go ahead and do this, save it, and go back over to this document here. And there we go, right? I can always go back and make changes. Maybe I like that gold look. So it updated both of the layers. So if you had multiple, if you had like, let's say another uh, layer on top of this, and maybe I want this one to focus on, more on the shadows for whatever reason. Oh, I don't like that. Let's try color burn. Nope, definitely not that. Linear burn, no. Maybe overlay. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine, right? Definitely don't like this very much. But the point is you can have, you know, many, many, many of these duplicated smart objects and you won't have to go in and manually update every single one. You just need to update one, save it, and you're good to go, right? I think I had this in all caps, right? Gold. The golden boop, indeed. All right, so gold. Still experimenting with the exact layer styles that I'm going to go with. Once I have that kind of set, I will upload a separate tutorial on that on YouTube. Now, I do want to talk a little bit more about smart objects. You know, we have these packaging layers over here. And what you might want is you might want to put your package label on something like this, right? And also something like this. It might be the exact same brand on both of them. But the last thing you want to do is have to update and you might have like a dozen of these. You don't want to have to update every single one. So what you might think about doing is going over and grabbing, let's say this guy here, popping this on here, using the exact same tip that we did before with our perspective transform, holding down your command or control key and kind of following the, the lines of this box. Of course, there are other ways of doing this, but to make it simple, there we go, right? So we have that on the box. And you can experiment with blend modes to blend it in a little bit if you needed to. We'll get to that afterwards if we have some time. But how do you update this, right? Because you might duplicate this over here and do something like this. And that looks fine, but it's a very manual process as you're seeing me struggle like this, right? And then if, you, if your brand changes, maybe you wanted to swap this out for, let's say this green version, for example, right? You have to go through this process all over again. So let's delete this. What I want to do first is I want to create a smart object. So if I bring this back in, I'm gonna make this nice and large. Now, before I transform this at all, I'm gonna convert this into a smart object. So I'm gonna, now it did come in as a smart object, but let's assume for a moment, let me flatten rasterize this. Let's assume this was not a smart object, right? What do you want to do is you want to, before you transform anything, is you want to convert to a smart object. Again, it's saving those original pixels um, and the transformation in an embedded document. So now I can go through and do the same transformation I did before, right? Something like this. It's not perfect. And again, there are other ways of doing this. just to be as perfect as I can. That looks pretty good, right? Now, again, because it's a smart object, we can go ahead very similar to the text and we can duplicate this over here and we can make some changes to it. And all the original pixels and all that fun stuff is still preserved even though we're duplicating this particular smart object, right? Let's 
looks like I need to make a little bit. I can drop the opacity a little bit just so I can see the layers behind it. There we go. That'll do. Again, not perfect. And I would probably experiment with some blend modes and things like that. But the point is, with smart objects being used, what we're able to do now is double click on any of them. It's gonna open up our original design. And now I can go to, let's say, Finder again. Or if you're working with Creative Cloud Libraries, you can pop open there, bring in a new one. Let's resize this up, save it, and then go back to our document and it updated both of them, even though they were transformed very differently, right? Which is fantastic. And now I can go through and maybe I can experiment with these blend modes. Multi Ooh, that one might be a little bit too much. Linear burn's not too bad in this case. Multiply's not bad, or I can double click and I also experiment with uh, blend if, which allow me to blend into, blend either the current layer or the underlying layer. So I can kind of pull this back a little bit just to bring in a little bit of those darker tones, as you can see there. The light slider, because it's basically all light, can be very difficult to work with, right? Maybe just a tiny bit. Eh. No, definitely not. That'll work, right? So smart objects, definitely use smart objects. One more example I wanna show you, one more tip that's not on this starter document is all about Puppet Warp. Puppet Warp's been here in uh, Photoshop forever, but we might want, you know, this image here, we might want to kind of alter her pose just a little bit. So if I go ahead and open this in Photoshop, the first thing I wanna do, I'm gonna try to speed through this as fast as I can, is I'm gonna wanna select the subject because if you were to add a Puppet Warp, let me actually unlock this, to an entire image. It's gonna give you this mesh over everything, which we don't want. We just want to affect the subject. So I'm gonna use my selection tool and let's go ahead and select subject using the cloud to make it a little bit more detailed because there are some you know, hairs and that sort of thing. And there we go. And then I can hop into select and mask. Obviously the selection wasn't perfect, but it wasn't bad. I can dive in here and maybe adjust Again, not perfect, but I'm using my refinement tool to get it as good as I can in you know a minute or two. Maybe around the hair a little bit. All right, let's output this to, let's say a, a new layer with layer mask. I did miss some areas here, but that's totally fine. Grab my brush, fix some areas in here. There we go. And then let's add a background back. I'll just fill it with a solid color. And now what we want to do is we want to kind of alter her pose just a little bit. Not, not to the extent where it's gonna be unnatural, but just a touch, right? You might be working on a magazine cover like day number two, and you might have run out of room and you just wanna move her arm a little bit or move her legs or whatever it might be. So under the edit menu, you can go down to puppet warp, which is gonna give you this mesh. And you might want to expand it a little bit right here at the top, just so you have a little bit more room to work with, especially if there's hair and things like that. So maybe up to about eight, for example. And you can show or hide the mesh if it's a little bit distracting. But what you're going to want to do now is start to set some points. And for a human, right, we might want to put those points like on shoulders where things will move or elbows, right? And then maybe knees and the midsection, right? Now, of course, we can go ahead and kind of move th these areas around, which looks okay, right? But you can also hover over top of one of them, hold down your Alt or Option key, and this will just allow you to kind of rotate it, right? Just like that. And again, you wanna probably keep these subtle. You can even, you know, just have one on this side here if you just want the shoulder to rotate or maybe the knee to rotate a little bit out, for example, right? Now, some of them look a little bit unnatural, but definitely, you know, work with your points until you get something that looks pretty decent, right? And then you can go ahead and press OK. And now we have our before and our after. And it did a pretty decent job. This arm over here looks a little bit unnatural, so I'd probably go ahead and edit that. Of course, if I was working with a smart object, I can make changes to that later on. But 
That is going to wrap it up for me for today and this week's Photoshop Bootcamp. Hope you all enjoyed this. If you do wanna see more Photoshop streams from me, definitely let me know on Twitter at Pinsky. I do wanna make more and more videos, of course. Big thank you to everyone who has tuned in this week and I will see you all next time. Thanks everyone. Thank you.